these are our announcements today. Um, we have an opportunity to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, which are Tim, still remember Blanche's family, and Addie, and Suzanne, and Elias, Renee, Anne, and also D.D. We need to let them know that we care for them and that we miss them. And also pray for Judy Reddish. She is Candy Funderburg's friend. She is in ICU with COVID. And today, after the worship service, everyone is invited to a brainstorming session for ideas for evangelism. So please bring your ideas instead. Tomorrow is a memorial service on the 18th at 3 o'clock for Ann. James at the Watt Hill Baptist Fellowship Church. Uh, she has a friend, Trudy, and her number is listed here. If you would like to uh, get in touch with Anne, you can do that through her friend, Trudy. On Tuesdays, on this Tuesday, there is a prayer meeting here at the church at 6, at six o'clock. So please read the chapters 49 and 50 of the Desire of Ages. Your comments and your are always welcome. And everyone is encouraged to join. Thursday, 11 o'clock, is Bible study at Callan's house. And the verse to memorize is Mark 9, 23. And everyone is welcome. <coughs> Communion is scheduled for Friday evening, September the 30th, at the church here at 6. There will be a practice on Tuesday, the 27th, at 7 p.m. Starting in January of 2023, communion will be held on the third Sabbath of the new quarter. <coughs> Have you been praying for young families to be brought into this church? Well, there's a way we can help do that. We can volunteer at the Pilgrim's Inn with the Child Care Center. You can greet the children at the door when they arrive at 7.30 to 9 and from 2 to 4. You can make friends and you can show God's love to the children and their parents. Mm -hmm. On October the 15th, our church will have, uh, we will go to the Lansford Canal State Park and we will have church there beginning at 10 a.m. The York Church has invited us into the Raptor Center in Huntersville, October the 8th at 2.30. So if you are interested, you can call Jim Lance, and his number is listed in the bulletin. And sometime today, if you have time, you can look at the back of the bulletin and read the health nuggets. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Let's join together this morning in our praise service, and that will be responsive reading number 787 in the back of our hymnal, and that's entitled Christianity in Practice. I'll read the light print, and then we'll all join in with the dark print. Number 787. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Never, Never flag in zeal, but aglow with, with the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. We repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, we will live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Yes. Our call to worship is printed in our bulletin. Please stand. reset our agendas as we sit in your presence for you assure us that where two or more gather in your name you're with us please guide our intentions and refocus our hearts to reflect your will this morning we welcome the holy spirit to be in our hearts to guide us through our daily lives please give us renewed strength and godly courage to obey you without question only you know what lies ahead let your peace rain down on us today as we seek you more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll next join together with our opening hymn, number 196, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. <laughs> Jesus, I'm 
Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Our offering today is for the local church budget. Romans 5, 8 tells us, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We worship with our resources because we follow the example of our God who is a blind giver. When God gives, he rarely focuses on the nature of the recipients or even the outcome. He gives out of love, faithful to this attribute, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's taken from Matthew 5, 45. In contrast, we are inclined to give exclusively to what we see and whose outcome we can control. As a result, some have withdrawn from participation in tithe and regular offering, not seeing the direct effect of their contributions. Others have resolved to support only local projects rather than a worldwide mission far from their eyes. This is not the blind giver attitude. We have a glimpse of what can happen when God's people reproduce the blind giver attitude. Have you heard about the Amazon of Hope, a floating church? It is not known by most of us and even fewer have visited this boat church. However, this project has materialized through the blind giving mindset. In 2016, God's children from all over the world pulled funds together to support the 13th Sabbath projects. And one implemented project was the floating church, the Amazon of Hope in Brazil. The result is inspiring. In the first 12 months of operations of this boat church, 286 people were baptized and three churches were planted in 2017. This is the testimony of Pastor Reno, who served on the Amazon of Hope. The boat church is God's way of saving people who have been forgotten by political, economic, and health systems. God, our example, is involved in a global mission towards those that we see and cannot see towards those that we know and do not know. This week as we worship with our tithes and regular offerings, we have another opportunity to demonstrate the same global mindset as our God. It is all of us in response to all of him. Will the deacon please come forward? Please help us be givers in your likeness. As we bring our tithe and offering today, teach us the spiritual lessons that we need to learn. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
Please join me now in our prayer anthem, which is listed in your book. stand before you on this beautiful Sabbath morning. We give you thanks for all of our many, many blessings. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your amazing mercy towards each of us and towards this world. Lord, we thank you for the joy and the peace that we have in you. And we thank you for the power of forgiveness now you forgive us for our sins. Lord, we thank you so much for the freedom and the, to be here today, to worship you and to praise you. We thank you for your holy word. As we open it today, we ask that you bless us as we claim the promises that you share with us in your word. Lord, we lift so many of our community and our friends and our families, our church family to you this morning. We lift those that cannot be with us this morning. Please lift their spirits and their hearts and may they know how much they are missed. We ask that you guide our thoughts this morning, Lord. Open our hearts as we worship. We lift the hurting, the neglected, and the lost in our world today. We ask that you fill us with your spirit, make us better witnesses for you, make us better examples of your love and grace. Empty us of ourselves and fill us with you. We ask for your spirit this morning as we worship, and we pray these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. scripture reading if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrew um, Hebrews I'm sorry to the second chapter Hebrews 2 we're going to read verse 17 Hebrews 2 verse 17 Hebrews 2 verse 17 therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Ms. Pat, for that. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Well, thank you, Angie, for applying to that. Um, appreciate it. Happy Sabbath, all. Happy Sabbath. There we are. I just want to make sure we're awake before I get started so I can tell how many I put to sleep after I'm done. It's good to be back in the house of God. Amen? Yeah. It's good to be here. You'll notice that our scripture reading is the same as it was last time I was here because we're going to focus on a different aspect of this verse here today, of Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. We've been going through this year looking at God and his love for us, Christ and him crucified. And today we're focusing on a different aspect of his character, and that is his mercy towards us. His mercy towards us. So turn and or someone near you, and I want you to say, your God is merciful. Uh, 
One more time. Your God is merciful. All right, let's pray and then we'll get into the sermon this morning. Dear Lord, I thank you so much that you love us, that you're here, and that you are merciful, that you are faithful as we've seen the last time I was here. Just thank you for that. Thank you for your kindnesses toward us. And I ask that you'd be with us this morning as we look at your mercy, as we look at you and, and how you deal with us and your dealings toward us. I knew behind your cross may you be fully seen and fully known and fully felt. In Jesus' name. Now, there's a couple of different words in Scripture that mean merciful. Obviously, some of us know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek with a few words of Aramaic here and there. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the word merciful and its different definitions in the Hebrew and the Greek and how it compares with our understanding of merciful here today. So to start out our study, go to Lamentations, starting you all out with a difficult one, Lamentations 3. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23. Can someone read that for us? Lamentations chapter 3 and verses 22 and 23. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. All right. Amen. The Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They knew every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The last time I was here, we looked at his faithfulness a little bit and saw it was there's no end, there's no beginning to it. It is far beyond. We can never reach the end of it. And it covers us completely. So now let's look at his mercy. Now this word mercy in Hebrew is a word, and we're going to say it together, but first I'm going to tell you how to say it, and some of you are going to struggle, and that's okay. And that word is chesed. So you try it. Chesed. And that word, it means it can mean loving kindness, beloved, merciful deeds, or just to have mercy. Loving kindness. It can also be a pet name for people that care a lot about each other. You are my chesed. You are the embodiment of my love and mercy. Chesed. It is because of the Lord's loving kindness and mercy that we are not consumed. So this, this word chesed, this word mercy comes from or is directly correlated to the word for loving kindness in the mind of the, the writer of Lamentations, in, in the mind of those who wrote in Hebrew. God's mercy comes from his love for us. And before we can continue to define mercy and discover God's mercy toward us, we need to know where it comes from and it comes from his loving kindness. There's another word that also has the meaning of merciful, and that word is found in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and verse 31, Deuteronomy chapter 4, and verse 31, can someone read that for us? For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your father, which he swore to them. Now just to take a step back and look at this verse, the Lord is your God is a merciful God. This is a parenthetical statement. And Moses is writing, he said, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. And then he explains that with, he won't forsake you. He will not destroy you, nor will he forget his covenant of your fathers, which he swear unto them. Now this word mercy here, I have another weird word to pronounce, raham. Raham. Now if you, can, if you want to know how to make that guttural noise in Hebrew, it's so raham. Good job. 
Now this word has a little different connotation when it's talking about mercy. It does mean mercy, but it has a sort of secondary connotation of compassion. So God's mercy is not only a product of his loving kindness toward us, it also is a compassionate mercy. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, your God is merciful compassionately. Raham, a compassionate mercy. There is reluctant mercy, is there not? I don't know if anyone's ever experienced reluctant mercy. Mercy because you had to, or mercy because you felt guilted into giving mercy. Maybe you got puppy dog eyes from your, your dog or your cat or child after they did something they weren't supposed to, and they seemed to be remorseful, so you reluctantly gave them mercy. But how does it change our understanding when we know Raham, mercy, comes from compassion? Now it doesn't say pity here. It says compassion. How does it change our understanding of God having compassionate mercy? When we look at the rest of the verse, your Lord, your God, it has a merciful, is a merciful and compassionate God. Therefore, he will not forsake you. Because he has compassion and mercy towards you. Therefore, he will not destroy you because he has compassion and mercy for you. Nor will he forget the covenant you made with your fathers, your ancestors, because he is compassionate and merciful toward you. Compassion. If there's someone in scripture who, who seemed to have an understanding of God's mercy and his compassion and seems to almost rely on that or have an intimate, intricate knowledge of God's mercy and his compassion, it was David. David was an intense man of intense emotions, of, of almost intense impulses. And so we're going to be looking at a few verses from the book of Psalms, and then we're going to turn to Isaiah, and we're going to look at more of this word raham, and how God's compassionate mercy interacts with us today. Psalm 103 and verse 8. Psalm 103 and verse 8, and when you find it, if someone will read that for us today. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. So here David uses the word not once but twice. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plentiful in mercy. Twice Davis, David tells us the Lord is merciful, the Lord is merciful. I want you to sit quietly with yourself and you can whisper it, you can say it in your head, but I want you to say my God is merciful to me. Plenteous and compassionate mercy. I don't know exactly what your picture of God is, but I want you to take David's picture of God and Moses' picture in Deuteronomy as God spoke and, and ask yourself quietly, do you have a picture of a God whose mercy is compassionate and free? Is your picture of God's mercy a picture of God reluctantly being merciful toward us, but a compassionate mercy? David, in, in this commentary on God's mercy here in Psalm 103, tells us that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. All of these concepts are tied together. The Lord is merciful, compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in that compassionate mercy. And I love that he says plenteous here. What does plenteous mean? Just shout out some answers. Lots. Lots. All right, what else? Abundant. Abundant. One more. Maybe from this side of the classroom. <laughs> what does plentiful mean? Full. Full. I like that full as well. Can we ever, is there a sin that God's mercy is not big enough or does not have enough of to cover? 
No. When David says God's mercy is plenteous, he is trying to communicate to you and I that it is so plenteous and so freely abundant and so compassionate that there is nothing we can ever do that uses it all up. There is nothing we can ever do where it is not completely covered. Think of your, your sin or your mistakes or whatever you want God's mercy to cover as the tiniest rubber ducky. And God's mercy and faithfulness and, and compassionate mercy as the ocean. As your, your sin, your problems, the things you want God to cover, the things you're afraid his mercy does not cover as a coin in a vast ocean. His mercy is compassionate. From his loving kindness. And it covers us. It is plenty. I want you to say that to your neighbor. Your God is merciful abundantly. Say it. Abundantly. I was going to say plenteously, but I figured abundantly might have been a little bit easier for us to wrap our tongues around. Your God is merciful abundantly. Psalm 145. Just a few pages over. Psalm 145 and verse 9, when you find it, if you will read it for us. So let me ask you a question. Are you God's work? Yes. Yes. Then is his tender mercy over you? Your God's tender mercy is over all of you. There is no, not a single person who when they ask for God's tender mercy, God's compassionate mercy, and I would ask, I would even um, and present to you that his mercy is over us, whether we see it or ask for it or not. Job tells us that the rain falls on the good and the evil. God's mercy covers all of his works that are just following him. Is that what the verse says? <coughs> Um, the Lord is good to those who are Christians. Um, let me try again. The Lord is good to those who live like I live. The Lord is good to how many? Is the Lord good to that neighbor whose political beliefs differ from you? Is the Lord good to that neighbor that you feel like or that person in your life that you feel like says nasty things about you behind your back? Does God's compassionate mercy cover the people that absolutely drive you nuts? Does God's compassionate mercy cover the children that have left the church? Does God's compassionate mercy cover their children as they seek to find their own way in the world, the grandchildren as well? Does God's tender mercy, compassionate mercy cover you even when you feel like it doesn't? Yes. David knew personally that God's tender mercies were over his entire life. The people we love and don't love people we like and don't like, the people that break our hearts break for. God's tender mercy covers everyone. I don't know that we can emphasize that enough. People who we perceive as, as not as, as whatever is us, people we perceive different from us, God's mercy covers them too. Full stop. Everything. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 18. Isaiah 30, 18. Can someone read that for us? 
Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. I'm glad you read that, Carolyn, because that word that's translated compassion there, how many have mercy in their version? You can see the correlation between the words for compassion and mercy in Hebrew, how they are combined. Do we give compassion to people who are perfect? Not typically. Do we give compassion to people who don't need compassion? No. Compassion, it's very nature. When God said, I'm having compassion upon you, it means we need it. When God says, I am going to have mercy, or Isaiah says, the Lord will be gracious and have mercy upon you, do you give mercy to people who don't need mercy? The very act of giving mercy means there is a need there. Someone has fallen short. The Lord will have compassion on you. The Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And, I, and, and though this is not the topic of our sermon today, I don't want us to miss how many times we've seen the word gracious and merciful in the same sentence. The Lord wants to be gracious to you. That he wants to have mercy upon you. And I, and I love this. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. When God is exalted... What is the overflow of his exaltation? What does he do with that? He shows mercy. When we are lifted up, I pose to you this question. When you are lifted up, when we are lifted up, when you are lifted up, when I am lifted up, do we show mercy? Is that our instinct, that the more we are lifted up, the more mercy we show? Are the people in power the ones who show the most mercy? When we are in positions of power. When we are in positions of privilege and power, do we show mercy? God says, the more I am exalted, the more mercy I want to show, and I do show to you. The more we are exalted in this world, what is our response of mercy? The Lord will wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have compassion and mercy upon you. Raham, compassionate mercy. Chesed, loving kindness, mercy that comes from that love. Nowhere in, in scripture do we have to earn mercy. Nowhere in scripture is it something we can calculate, have a list so that we can receive it. God's mercy is upon all of us all of the time, full stop. And the New Testament confirms that. We have a few verses in the New Testament where we can find the word for mercy in Luke 6 and verse 36. Luke chapter 6 and verse 36, if someone will read that for us. Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. Therefore the merciful will be the God of our soul. There it is. Be merciful. Just as your Father in heaven is merciful. This word merciful is the word, and this might be a little easier to say, El Elouis. Can you say that? Elouis. It means compassion and merciful. Compassionate and merciful. Once again, in scripture, in Greek, now a completely different language that developed at a different time than Hebrew. We have the same connotation that mercy is present with compassion. That mercy is almost a product of compassion. Now I want us to look at our own lives as we've explored this, as we've seen that mercy and compassion are tied, and think, am I a compassionate person? Quietly ask yourself that. Am I a compassionate person? Not just when it's convenient, because we find that we found that compassion and mercy usually are coming into play at the most inconvenient of times when someone has wronged us. 
Am I a compassionate person? Do I show mercy? Be therefore merciful. Show compassion. Love others, especially when they have wronged you, when they've upset you, when they've said something. Show them compassion. Back a few verses and chapters to Luke 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1 and verse 50. Luke chapter 1 and verse 50. Can someone read that for us? And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. His mercy is on those who fear him. Now this is Mary's song. This is the song of Mary, and she says his mercy is upon us generation after generation after generation. And I, and I find comfort in this. And Mary is saying, hey, God's mercy is everlasting. It is passed down and passed on from him to every single generation. His mercy is upon those that fear him from generation to generation. Do we show mercy from generation to generation? There's a, a talk in the church and the world at large of the generational divide between the boomers, the baby boomers, and previous generations and generation um, uh, Z. There's different political beliefs. There's different ideologies. I mean, they look at organizations completely and wildly different than the, the baby boomers and, and other generations around there. So are we showing, and I know this is not the intention of this text, but I think it's good for us to, to pause and look, are we showing generational mercy? As God shows mercy from generation to generation, are we showing generational mercy? Are we showing generational compassion? And those of us who are younger here in the audience, there's a few of us, do we show compassion on those who are older? Do we show mercy? And our differences of opinions and ideologies, ways of doing things, is there compassion and mercy in our generational healing? Ephesians 2 4, and then we're wrapping up. Ephesians 2 4, and when you get there, I want you to pause a minute and turn to your neighbor and say, Your God is merciful. Can someone read Ephesians 2 and verse 4? God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us. And there it is. There is mercy, a Lewis, in its fullness. God, who is rich in mercy, because of his love, in that he loved us. God's merciful doesn't, God's mercy doesn't come from a place of duty or just sheer responsibility to those he created. Sure, I'm sure God feels some responsibility, but God's mercy, his compassion toward us comes from his what? His love. <laughs> and we've seen this in the word chesed, that the same concept exists in the Old Testament. So a greater question we need to ask ourselves, do we really love each other? Do we really love each other? How can we be compassionate and merciful if we do not have the foundation of love for each other? There's one last thing we, we can discuss. Can we ever reach the ends of God's love? Can we ever reach the ends of his faithfulness? Can we ever reach the ends of his mercy? No. 
Is there anything that we've set up until this point and in all of scripture that says we can earn his mercy? Can we work for his mercy? Can we change his mercy? Can we affect his mercy? His mercy is so far, big, and beyond us that it is like a small coin trying to affect the, the motion, the waves, the, the currents of the ocean. His mercy is in you and on you and over you, and all you have to do is allow it to flow through you. And that love and that mercy will indeed flow out to others. Turn to your neighbor. Say, your God is merciful. Your God is compassionate. Your God loves you. Now I want you to say it to yourself quietly. I want you to say, my God is merciful. My God is compassionate. My God loves me. Folks, you can never reach the end of that mercyfulness. And if we turn to Hebrews chapter 2, why does it matter that we know what his faithfulness is? Why does it matter that we know what his mercy is? Because what is the next part of that verse? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. It says to make reconciliation that he may be a faithful high priest. To make reconciliation for the sins of his people. As God discusses with himself, with Jesus and the Father, we know the ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. As God discusses our names, he is as God forgives your sins, as he works in his work in the heavenly sanctuary right now for you, he is so full of mercy toward you that we don't need to be afraid. Wherefore, in all things, it benefited him to be made like unto his people, that he might be compassionate, loving, and faithful and merciful high priest in all things pertaining to God as Jesus represents us before God he is compassionate merciful and faithful we don't need to be afraid of, of the judgment I think a lot of people talk about the judgment today in the context that it can be really scary and fearful and we don't have a lot of understanding of it and here as we learned today in the last time that I was here a few weeks ago Jesus is merciful and compassionate towards us in the work of salvation your God is merciful towards you your God is compassionate towards you your God is faithful towards you and your God loves you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are merciful and that you are compassionate. Thank you that that mercy and that compassion is for us. And that there is nothing we can do to change it, overcome it. That it is in us and around us. Help us to make way for it in our heart and mind. Help us to claim it, to lean on it, to understand it, and to love you more because of it. Thank you for having mercy on us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will stand with me, we have our closing song and then our benediction. And please do not forget that immediately after our lunch today, we will be having our evangelism brainstorming session. Um, it says 1.30 in the bulletin. If we finish eating quicker, we will do that. Um, so I encourage you all to stay for that. But our closing hymn is number 526. Please stand with me. Because he lives. Number 526. <laughs>
Thank you. 